Welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Slickbaum. Here on the Aerospace Advantage, we speak with leaders in the DoD, industry, and other subject matter experts who explore the intersection of strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. So if you like learning about aerospace power, you are in the right place. To our regular listeners, welcome back. And if it's your first time here, thank you so much for joining us. As a reminder, if you like what you're hearing today, do us a favor and follow our show. Please give us a like and leave a comment so that we can keep charting the trajectories that matter to you most. I want to begin today's show by laying out a simple precept. Effective air power demands that we fly in a harm's way, we execute our missions, and we return safely to base, and then we do it all over again to keep up the fight. If we lose too many aircraft or too many aircrew, then our combat air power implodes. And trust me, as a nation, we know this from experience. In the fall of 1942, loss rates were so bad for the 8th Air Force bomber crews that they were calculated that aircraft and airmen would all be gone in three months if things did not improve. That's what the whole movie 12 O'Clock High is all about. And frankly, these sorts of casualty rates are hard to imagine today given that we are used to permissive combat conditions. Consider that over the past 30 years, the Air Force has lost fewer than two dozen aircraft to enemy defenses. Tomorrow's conflicts promise to be far more lethal. And we've got to wholly rethink how we build the Air Force to account for that. And it's not just about airplanes, it's also about investing in people. This episode is designed to dig into this topic of survivability and what happens when we fall short of that objective. And all of our guests on the Aerospace Advantage are important. But today, we are so honored to host an extra special guest, Lieutenant Colonel Gene Smith, United States Air Force retired, who flew F-105s in Vietnam. He was shot down in 1967 over Hanoi and endured unspeakable conditions in the notorious Hanoi Hilton as a POW until his release in March of 1973. Now, before we bring on Gene, I'd like to welcome Major General Retired Larry Stutz Stutzream and also Heather Lucky Penny of our Mitchell team. Stutz Lucky, thanks so much for joining me today. Hey, great to be back, Slick. Thanks. I'm looking forward to the discussion today. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I am as well. So without any further delay, Lieutenant Colonel Gene Smith, sir, thanks so much for being with us today. It is an absolute honor. And I just want to point out to everyone that we are coming up on the 50th anniversary of your release from the Hanoi Hilton. So that has to be quite a milestone for you, sir. Without a doubt, our family texts each other and hugs each other, Nick. Every year that comes by, there are two dates. So one is the 14th of March when we left Hanoi. And the other one is the 17th of March, St. Patty's Day, when I got to March Air Force Base in Riverside, California, when I saw them for the first time. Yeah, sir, the, these dates, I'm literally getting uh, goosebumps as I'm chatting with you. So again, thanks for being here. But I want to ask you this, and sir, of course, every question that we throw at you is just coming with the utmost respect for what you've endured. Would you mind to bring our listeners up to speed on your Air Force career before the shoot down? When did you join the service? Was the F-105 the main aircraft type that you flew? And was this your first tour in Vietnam? First tour in Vietnam, I graduated from Mississippi State in 1956 in chemical engineering. Everybody had to go through the AFR or ROTC, and I picked the guys with the blue suits by accident. And the reason I got in advance, because they paid 90 cents a day, I found out. And that was a significant raise over what I was making or living on. And when I finished college in 56, I had to go to nav school first because I had astigmatism. And so I didn't qualify for pilot school. And went through nav school and then went to RO school at James Conley because I had no desire to do anything on big airplanes. And I wound up with an assignment to Fort Smith Air Force Base in Michigan. Got into pilot school by two weeks, or I would have been too old, and went to Williams Air Force Base, and having been a backseater in the Air Force that long, it was a distinct advantage. In fact, I had already flown the T-33 in the front seat 
and knew how to fly airplanes and all this stuff that went along with it. So finished first in the class, could have gone to 100s or F-102s. And I'd been in the Air Defense Command, so I chose 102s. And went to Perry and checked out, went to Travis Air Force Base, spent 18 months there. Great tour, a lot of just a lot of fun. Raising by then, Ray and I had three kids. One came just as I got to Travis. And it was a wonderful, great, fun tour. A lot of great guys and everything. While I was there, I got an assignment to Germany. And we went, yay, yay, yay. We got a Going to have a lot of fun over there. So I went to Han Air Force Base in 60 and 65, in January of 65. Spent two years there in the 496 Squadron, learning an awful lot about flying weather. Made two zero zero landings in the F 102 there. That's interesting. But the, with the Deuce was a great. Delta wing airplane, it was just about as easy to fly as any airplane in the inventory, I think. So it was easy to do that. And in December of 66, my family and I just came back from a ski trip down to Garmish area. And when we walked into a little squadron get together that night, just before Christmas, a friend of mine walked up and says, hang on. You and I have F-105 assignments to Thailand, to Southeast Asia. And I says, oh, shucks, probably not just exactly like that. But then I went up to the squadron commander, Jack Ratty, who was, I was one of his guys, and said, sir, I volunteer for F-4s. That was a new airplane coming in the inventory at that time. And he says, you can't. You need experienced jet guys in the F-105 inventory over there. They're running out of first assignment guys. I know that's good to know. All right, sir. So now you're assigned to the F-105. What's next for you? My assignment was to Nellis to check out in the 105. We had six wonderful months in uh, Nellis checking out in the 105. But I'd like to tell a little quick story here about that. Like I said, I absolutely did not want to fly the F-105. I wanted to fly the F-4. That was a new airplane coming in the inventory. And checking out in the airplane was rather easy, I thought. And about the fourth or fifth mission uh, that I flew was a flight of four, an instructor leading us, and I don't I think I was number four in the squadron, and we'd been up around Indians. Springs where Area 51 was, and there's a gunnery range, control gunnery range up there. And when we were coming back into Las Vegas, I was number four flying route formation to 300 feet apart. We were the lead was probably 100 feet off the deck, and we were stacked up a little bit. And all of a sudden, I see shock waves started to start to build up on the airplane, the other airplanes. And I said, man, we must really be going fast. And I took a peek at the uh, airspeed indicator and the Mach number, and then we were going 0.95 Mach. And I had still had a half inch or an inch of throttle in it before we hit Barnum. So that's when I came to the conclusion, said, if I'm going to war in an airplane, maybe this is what the airplane I should go in it. I shall ever be grateful that I was a member of the Thug Pilots, without a doubt. Sir, what sort of tactics did they teach you so you'd be ready for combat? I mean, they knew your next stop was Vietnam. We're a month and a half away from being time to leave to go to war. And we said, what kind of tactics are they flying over there? What kind of tactics? I mean, are we going to fly single ship or are we going to be in flight one flight of four or what? The answer was, we're not sure. Can you imagine that in this day and time? That's, we're fixing to go to war, and they're not sure what the tactics are. That is crazy. And so about a month before we left, there was a lieutenant colonel that came in from Karat. It, I don't know what he came back. I don't remember what he came back for, but he uh, 
And he, he briefed us, and we said, sir, what kind of tactics you got flying over there? He said, well, if the guys over at Karat, Tak Lee, fly different tactics than we do. And there was a kind of a silence. We said, well, what kind of tactics do y'all fly? He said, we got this big box formation, and we just all roll in from that. I says, you know, everybody's going, it's got to be a little bit better than that. But the answer is, we didn't know what kind of tactics were there. So when did you finally get some situational awareness of the tactics? I learned what the tactics were Tockley when I landed there with some of the other guys, with three, four other guys that was going to be in that, in that wing. And we just got there and didn't even hardly get our B-4 bags set down before we got assigned to a squadron, two of us when the 33rd, 333rd squadron and the others were scattered through the other ones. But the afternoon that I got there and checked in and had my, even had my helmet with me, we went down and one individual took three of us up and showed us the pod formation that we would be flying on the missions up north in Pack 6 All right, sir, so... You're in theater, you're flying missions. What was it like? Every day in our squadrons, we didn't have Monday or Friday or Thursday or Tuesday. Every day was two frags, two missions, morning and afternoon, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, as an alpha strike, weather permitting. And we would always plan an alpha strike. An alpha strike is one to pack six. And that strike would include four flights of four strike airplanes, Ds, F-105Ds, and a flight of four weasels, F-105Ls, as our SAMs are in help. And everybody had their own tanker, which was great by the time that wasn't the case early on. And we had a target. And all four of those flights of four would bomb the same target when we went to North Vietnam 99% of the time. I can remember one mission when that was not the case. But we'd get our frag in the afternoon before the early morning strike. And the early morning strikes, we usually cranked. We usually start engines somewhere around 4.30, which meant your briefing, the first briefing, was around midnight. Now, get yourself on a calendar to where you can get a little bit of sleep and get up, and we'd go to the briefings at about 11.50 or whatever it was and get the briefing, the weather, and the lineup and all that, and then we would go have breakfast and come back and then go do our initial our do individual flight briefings and then go settle up, and it was all time to everybody – from a start time to a taxi time to a takeoff time. And it was the same thing every time. Each each squadron would put up one flight except the squadron that had the force. And that squadron would put up a flight of four with a force commander in it and a deputy. And the next flight would be the first bomb flight that would also come out of that squadron two flight leads, and so you'd have four flights of four plus your weasels, and you'd have two spares with the first, with the force commander's flight and the the first bomb flight. So you had 16, 18 airplanes plus the weasels taxiing all within about 10 minutes, 15 minutes apart out to take off. And then we would take off individual flights of four, go route up to your tankers, and each flight had a tanker that would be at the proper place, either over Laos or over Gulf of Tonkin, depending on where the target was in North Vietnam. Does that make sense? If it was in the, if it doesn't matter whether it was 6A or whatever, if it was in 6A, you could either come in from Laos or you could come in from the Gulf. It was picture Hanoi, the Northeast Railroad, 
that basically was the eastern border of Pac 6A. So if it was close to there, you would come in over the Gulf. If anywhere else, like coming down Thud Ridge to Fukien, Taiwan, those targets over there, then you would come over layups. Does that paint any kind of picture that looks for me? If you're looking at a map, it will. Yeah, no, it absolutely makes sense. One of the things that's astounding to me is just the sheer volume of aircraft that you needed to push out just one go, one mission. That's a lot. <laughs> Morning, afternoon, yeah. days a week. I wish I had been there. That had to be something awesome to hear all those engines okay. start. But there were no Mondays, there were no Thursdays, there were no Sundays. Somebody asked me one time, I said, Do you go to church over there? I said, Nope, no one Sundays were. Because you're just flying least. all the time. So now, sir, you're going up to North Vietnam a lot on these missions. How'd the average sortie work out? In that flight of four, pod formation we were a thousand feet apart virtually line abreast the number two man would be about 500 feet below one the number three man would be about 500 feet above lead and the number four man would try to position himself slightly in between and the reason for that we all had electronic jamming pods the two and four man in each squadron would have two the one and three man would have one and that did a when you took four flights with that with those on board that did a great job in deterring the sa2s sa1s radar guidance from seeing us can you describe for us what it was like when you got close to the target area we got closer to the got within about three or four minutes from the target the sky just erupted and black balls with red in the middle of it. And I said, holy shit, they know exactly what altitude we are. Duh. We've been doing the same thing for a long time, and we did the same thing every time that I was there. And about two minutes out from Roland, which was 20 miles in Hanoi, was I could see it down there when I would look over that way, and the weasels were calling all these SAM sites, leave this, no threat, no threat. And about that time, probably 30 seconds, probably a minute and a half before roll-in, a SA-2 came between me and my lead so close, I could read the Russian writing, literally. And no sooner as it gotten by, get a call from the only transmission that the force commander would make, he would say, whatever his call sign was, Scotch Force Burner now. Everybody would like to burn her, and the four flights would get in an echelon formation to roll in the proper direction. And just as we were doing that, a guy in the flight in front of us got hit, and that airplane just torched, and it was nothing but just a blazing Roman candle as we all rolled in, and He's right in front of me, and they foot, he foot, filled my wings, windscreen the whole time I was going down. And then that crap going by me, and I said, shit, I ain't going to make it to the bottom of the roof my first run. Oh, and and we pulled out, and a sidewinder missile went through the flight going out, and then we're, done, we're on our way going out, and I'm going, holy smokes. And I sucked my water bottle dry that I had with a little lantern over the shoulder, and I said, I've got 94 more of these to go. Sir, I got to say, that's absolutely incredible. You're describing a threat environment that airmen haven't seen for decades. But as we often highlight here on the podcast, we as an Air Force better get ready for it again, given what our adversaries are doing. So what about the mission when you were shot down? Pulse rates went up big time because you knew somebody was going to get shot down. And as one of my friends said, You'd look up and down the, in the briefing room. You'd look up and around and says, somebody's going to get shot down, but one, one of which one of these summits is going to be because it ain't going to be me. And my number four man, Jim Thomas, was a in flight, and he just was a really good kid. And he was sitting there eating, and he had 60-something missions, and this was my 33rd. And he looked at all of us, and he had tears in his eyes, and his face was red. And he looked at us and he says, you guys aren't going to make it. 
you can't make it through this environment. I said, oh, bullshit, Jim. Says, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. And then change the subject and go on. Well, we go out and saddle up and we go north. And Wildcat, that was my call sign. We were the number four flight in the force that day. And it was a beautiful afternoon. And brief for defenses, every gun in North Vietnam was in a 30-mile radius for the center of Hanoi almost. And that day, we saw a lot of SAMs come up 20 miles out, 30 miles out. And you could see Hanoi or about where it was. 20 miles out, we start seeing some SAMs come up, and the weasels would call them. And I didn't hear any bandit call, so because they weren't going to get up there and all that flack and crap where we were. And as, as we got close to we were rolling left, and I had carefully briefed my flight. Guys, we released at 9,000 feet. I don't care if you don't feel like you've got your pipper on the proper place, pickle. We can always come back. And so when we rolled in, the way the force commander placed us for the last flight to roll in, we were slung out a little bit. You fighter guys can figure that one out. And when I rolled in, instead of having a 45-degree dive, I had probably a 40-degree dive, and that affects where that pipper is, where the bomb's going to hit from where your pipper is. So I pressed about 500 feet as we roll in. And I mean, our whole force, my flight especially, because that's the one I knew about, it was getting hammered before we rolled in. You couldn't hardly see the next airplane. And I uh, rolled in, and we... Our speed was 550 that we pickle at, and it, you got that pretty quickly as you roll down, 550 indicated. And this is, I pulled off, I briefed it, I'd pull off slightly right and then go back left and get to Sud Ridge. And I says, I will give you a little throttle, but use your friggin' burner if you need to keep up with me. Well, as soon as I got the nose up, and it just almost got on the horizon, pulling out of the dive. I felt the airplane get hit. I said, oh, shit, I just got hit. And about that time, the airplane tumbled. I oh, found that gosh. out much later, what happened, because I was redding out and blacking out in the airplane. And the only I couldn't even get my move, my hands, to try to get toward the ejection handles. And the only thing that I thought that went through my mind was I'm not going to die in this son of a bitch. Sir, I just have to say that this is just, it's absolutely unreal. You're telling us about this. We've been reading about these experiences, but I don't think anyone can really understand what you've experienced at the moment. So what happened next? I got out of the airplane and floating down and you could still see and hear crap going by me. And I imagine I probably got out about four to 5,000 feet, 4,000 feet, somewhere in that area. And I started floating down and took inventory through my radio, tried to call on the radio, but the beeper was going, and I couldn't get myself up to turn the beeper off. So I broke the handle off the radio, got my other radio out, broke the handle off of it, antenna off of it, threw it away, threw my six-shooter away. Because I'm right on the edge of Hanoi, and I could always really see people. As I came down, and hit, I hit on the kind of on the edge of Hanoi. It was in a field, and as I rolled back to hit my quick releases, one of the Vietnamese had a AK-47, I assume, because he ripped a burst through me. And two bullets went in my left thigh, came out on the inside of my thigh. Didn't hit the femoral artery, didn't hit the femur, didn't go up through my groin. God had something else for me to do that day. And so I was just a very lucky man. I had coming down in the chute, I noticed it on my right lower leg on the outside, just pretty close to the femur, or not the femur, what's that shin bone. I see a hole through my G suit big enough that I could see the bone in my leg. The, the chin bone. Ouch. So it was probably broken, but. Uh, it your, so when you got on the ground, were you captured right away? Yeah. So, so well, as soon as I hit the ground and rolled back to my quick releases, the guy shot me. Shot me twice with the AK 47. 
And then I was undressed with a machete down to my shorts, T-shirts, and they didn't cut my boots off. They cut everything else off. And then they wired my hands together, wrists to the inside, put a little piece of string and a rope to it and gave it to a little Vietnamese girl. And then I'm all through the crowd with being beaten and whatever. I just, my mind goes blank about that. And I realize I don't remember very much of it. And then a little later, this was 4.30 in the afternoon. That's what the TOT was when all this is happening. So we were approaching five o'clock, got close to the outside of all the people and everything that kind of quieted down in a little home, a little house. Or, and in a few minutes, a truck came along and I was put into that blindfolded and still my wrist tied, and then off to the Hilton. Sir, what kind of mindset did you have to adapt to survive this? Fighter pilots go through training for this, but I think you've got to dig deep to make it through what you're describing. I'm going to uh, say a couple of things here, and I hope, I hope y'all understand why I'm saying it. You know, we had gone to survival school. I went to survival school in 64. And that shit, that was just a practice on seeing how hungry you could get and seeing walking through the snow up by Dead Air Force Base. And they taught us a little, they told us a little bit of the stories <clears throat> about World War II and some about Korea. And they taught a little about interrogation techniques. But do you know when you start learning how to be a POW, if that ever happens to you? It ain't in survival school. It's not in survival school. It starts with your parents, or it starts with a coach, or it starts with a preacher, or it starts with a teacher to instill in you what is right and what America is all about. If you And you are very fortunate if you have had a God-fearing family that have exposed you to God, because I can't imagine going through that stuff and being in prison without God. I've spoken many times on taking God for granted. <laughs> That's a, and that was a person pretty good, one, I thought. But at any rate, you don't learn, really learn a lot about that. What they miss telling us in survival school, they taught you about interrogation techniques, but that went out the door in about the first three seconds once you were in there and you said, they asked you name, rank, serial number, and date of birth. And then you said, what kind of an airplane you were flying? And I said, I can't tell you this. And the next thing you know, I was knocked all the way across the room. And then I was put in a ball inspecting parts of my body that I had never seen before with my arms behind me and a, and a iron bar with some cloth on it and some filings on it in my mouth with a rope around it. And you just pull tighter and tighter. And then he left. And I said, hell, I'm going to die. But maybe I'll pass out. Well, I didn't pass out. And I have no idea how long it lasts. Last, but after a while, they came back in and they opened it up again. And they asked me what kind of airplane I was flying again. And I thought to myself, the code of conduct said you couldn't do that, though. Name, rank, serial number, date of birth. That's it. They changed that now, fortunately. And they changed it right after we came back from Vietnam. But I said, you know, I just bombed a bridge right down the street with that airplane. They didn't know what kind of airplane I was in. So I said, 105. But what was your target? I stupidly says, can't tell you that. Well, I went through the same thing. And we went on and on. How many people went in flight? Can't tell you that. So after a while, I said, I can't, I'm not going to be able to do this. So I started making up stuff. And these kind of questions went on. How many people were in your squad? And I'd make up some number. How fast were you flying when you came over our country. I don't know, as fast as it will go. And some of those answers they liked. And you made up stuff, but you made up stuff that you could remember. When they asked me who my squadron commander was, I said, Bart Starr. Anybody know who Bart Starr was? Football a, player. He, 
he was a quarterback at University of Alabama in 1956. And he happened to be a roommate of mine out in, at our ROTC summer camp. But, you know, just made up people's names that you could remember. And I went through, I've said, seven days of interrogation. And I've said the same amount in it, but I really didn't know. And then never got any treatment for that the bullet holes on my leg, left leg. And actually, they never gave me a lot of problems. And the one on the right, on my lower leg, by the shin bone, that thing swelled up pretty bad. And it was painful for a good long while, meaning days. And after about seven days in, the, in that little knobby room, as we call it, which was I don't know, 20 by 20, had a table and a stool and a couple of chairs. That's where they interrogated us. And after that, they took me out of that and took me over to heartbreak. All right, sir. How did things play out from there? I stayed by myself for about a couple of months. And then I was put in with three other guys. Two of them had been in my squadron. And another guy was off the carrier, Carl C. And he was raised right below me in Mississippi, in, in Tunica, Mississippi. But anyway, any rate, we we moved into this three-man, four-man cell, stayed there. That was a challenge. That was a challenge. Lock yourself up with your best husband or best wife in a small room, no TV, not very much to eat, and y'all spend 24 hours a day for a month. See how you're doing when you get out. Yeah. All right, sir. So you are in the Hanoi Hilton for a while, and then you were moved to Sante, the prison made famous because special forces tried to rescue you and your fellow POWs, and then you get moved to another facility. When did you get a sense that things were changing and there might be some hope for release? And just to be clear, you've been in prison for multiple years since 1967 at this point, and now we're talking about 1971. We get into November time frame of 72 and the first part of December and then a little part of, further into December and then one of the guards had a little compassion he always had. He told somebody up there, he said one of the, in another room and we could, in another building we could contact each other instantly there. He says B-52s bomb Hanoi and we go yeah. that's the best thing we've ever heard so is that and when you began to realize that that the tide was turning did you guys think that you might be close to release? we said finally finally Nixon had his field and there had been one little incident that happened in October of uh, 72 that year some of the some high-ranking Vietnamese came by and they came into each building and they got all the guys together and sitting in the room and they came in and briefed us, if you will. And they put out a bunch of propaganda about the North Vietnamese were, were really trying to negotiate with the um, perfidious Americans to die to die. But they, the Americans pulled out right up to the last minute, some kind of red crap. But then but when they left, we looked at each other and said, guys, We've never heard this before, so we figured that there probably was something serious. If you remember the history of the Vietnam War, that was about the time in the fall of 72 when Kissinger made the comment about the negotiations that peace is at hand. Well, somebody backed out somewhere. I don't remember the details on that, but that precipitated linebacker two. And that guard told us after they started bombing Hanoi that the next time y'all move, you will be going home. All right, sir, what happened next? What was the actual release like? Well, we moved down to, to back to Hanoi on January the 19th of 73. And we knew we were going home soon. We just didn't know when. We didn't know what the, what, uh, really what was the result of all of this we had heard. 
So we got back down in my bunch and they grouped us by order of shoot down back in, in Hanoi. You know, the early guys were in, I think the Hilton or one of it, and then had some in the zoo. We were in the plantation. We had four groups. When we got back down there, John Flynn, the colonel who was a vice commander at Barat, he was in our group, and he was a senior man of all the POWs up there. So he was about four or five cells down from where I was at the plantation. Right after we had got there, the camp commander called Flynn up to his office and told him, go back and have your men come out, we have something to tell them. So we go all out and he go, John formed us up and man, we were spiffy. We knew something was fixing to happen. Part of the agreements was that they read the agreements to the POWs. So they read the those agreements to us telling us that we were going to go home in four different groups. Turns out that was, just, that was close. And it, the first group was leaving on um, the 12th. And then the next one was supposed to be about March of 1st. And there was the next one was March 14th, which we figured out would be us that were in that group. McCain was in that group, of course, Flynn, Bud Day. But by then, they were feeding us enough to where we'd gotten used to all that crap anyway. They were feeding us good, and we were out a couple of days and a couple of hours in the morning, a couple of hours in the afternoon. So and we were just looking forward to the time to get there. As we got, and we got about four days, five days, six days, I don't know exactly when, before the scheduled March the 14th time, they gave us a package from the Red Cross. And then they came in and they measured us. They had three or four different types of pants and clothes and they measured us for our go home clothes and the morning that we were supposed to go they came in and gave us those clothes so we put those things on and then about 10 o'clock nine o'clock and i really don't remember the time we came in god told us to suit up and had a little ditty bag that had some poetry crap in it and some guys took out different things. I said, I just want out of here. I should have thought that maybe some of this stuff would be nice to have as a memento. But we got on a bus at the plantation about, I don't know, I guess 11 hour, 11 o'clock or somewhere along there. I really shouldn't remember that time, but I don't. And they took us out too. And by the way, guys, I appreciate y'all let me tell this. And as I'm telling you this, it is going through my mind what I saw during those times. Yeah. It's amazing. Just like a movie reel is running over that day of what the camp was like and what the streets looked like. It's the only time we ever went anywhere in Vietnam during the day. And it's the only time we ever went anywhere that we weren't blindfolded. And then they took us down to the tarmac where you've seen all the pictures for all of these years. And they got us out and make sure we were in the order of shoot down. We helped them out with that. And they took us down there and introduced us, called our name and went out, saluted that. I don't even remember what the guy's name was. And went out to the 141 with the engines running and the back end open and the most beautiful American flag that I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And we got on that sucker and closed it up. And we were rolling, and we didn't say much while we were rolling. And when we took off, we went yay, yay, but we didn't say too much because it would be just like them son of bitches to shoot one of the airplanes down and it'd probably be ours. But as soon as we, the pilot called back and says we were feet wet, things changed. And I don't remember, and I should, but I don't remember that um, – how long it took us to get to Clark, but it was still light when we got to Clark. And I mean, it, we were about the third group. And guys, there must have been 8,000 people at least that there to welcome us back. And as they put us on buses to take us to the hospital, it had been lined, the streets were just lined with people. 
Well, today we've got another guest with us, and we want to bring this full circle. We have Rob Collings with the American Heritage Museum of Hudson, Massachusetts. And if you've been watching the news lately, you may have noticed that Rob's museum just opened a new exhibit to honor the POWs and educate the public about their experience. Now, this in and of itself isn't wholly unique, but we are fortunate that museums have covered this topic. So what is really special here, though, is that this museum has the only POW cell, and I mean 100% original, outside of Vietnam as part of the exhibit. And it's all the way from the very same block where they first held Gene in Vietnam, the heartbreak block. So, Rob, first, how did you ever get into this? We were very fortunate to have made available to us these cells that came from the Heartbreak Hotel section or New Guy Village from the Wallow Prison. And the Wallow Prison goes back to about 1890 as a French colonial prison. But during the Vietnam War, it was converted into a detention center for mostly airmen that were shot down. A lot of them went off to other prisons. It became known as the Hanoi Hilton, as we know it today, by Bob Shoemaker, Shoemaker, who coined that name, and he was the second shootdown. It was thankful that a gentleman by the name of Glenn Richards really had the foresight in the 90s when they were tearing down this prison, the Wallow Prison, um, to make way for a new hotel, that he enlisted the help of some others that were not American, that could go to Vietnam, and that could actually acquire parts of these cells to bring them back to Canada first and then later to the United States. Uh, it's very thankful that they had that foresight. Otherwise, there are no original cells outside of the couple that are left in Hanoi. And of course, they're not telling the story of what Gene just told us, of what really went on during the Vietnam War and the torture the physical and mental torture, the isolation that all of these airmen suffered. Yeah, Rob, that was one of the things that when Gene is telling the story, I'm sure just from his own personal experience, he was just, in, in my words, just nonchalant about it. But we know what these men endured there was just horrific. And you've been able to really display that to the American public. And I've got to ask, what were your objectives when you created the display? So everybody knows the POW MIA flag. It's the second most flown flag in America. There was a bill recently passed that was very bipartisan. It was introduced by Senator Warren and Senator Cotton, and you don't get any more opposed politically than those two senators, but they can all agree on this is important to our history. The POWs and the MIAs, all those who never returned home, are a group we can never forget. And we wanted to take that flag and make a story where people then can understand what it really means. We all see the flag, but we don't know what it meant for the POWs who are over there, who are suffering through this. So by having this original cell, you walk into it, your hairs stand up because you're in the cell that hundreds of these guys had spent time in, that they were left alone in there in isolation. They were shackled for, at some point, months on end. Can you imagine being shackled to a concrete bed for a couple months? They, To a degree, they'll trivialize it because they don't really want to put us through what it was, what it's truly like. This was horrific. And we have to understand that this is a price that these pilots had to pay for their service to our country. And no one should ever go through that. And then also the other part of that story is the ones who never made it home. They might have been taken POW and never released. They died in captivity or those that were lost in service to our country. And there's still so many missing around the world from wars past, not just Vietnam. Sure. Again, these POWs don't really want to take us through their journey with their stories. But if anybody doesn't know, and they have a chance to read on some of the subject, just your point of the shackles, these were French prisons that were made for Vietnamese folks that their physical stature was different compared to an American football player, fighter pilot, right? So to have your ankles and wrists shackled and something that was made for Vietnamese that were just physically smaller in stature, I mean, it was so much more torturous than just being in shackles, just to really 
really bring this point home of what these people endured was just absolutely horrific. And Heather and Stutz, I know that you were both there for the dedication. So please describe for us, what was your impression of it? You're both familiar with the story, but how did, you know, seeing the actual cell and no kidding the door that Gene probably walked past the concrete bunks that were there, the actual brick walls, the leg irons, how did this impact you as American airmen? It's like it was it was so deeply emotional for a number of reasons, right? For one, I have a family connection. My father was a Sandy in Vietnam, so he did combat search and rescue in A7s. So he went out searching for these downed airmen and trying to provide the fire support to bring him back home. And as a little girl, I grew up listening to his mission tapes. So there was a very personal connection here. But there's also something very special about the fact that Rob has the actual cells in that we can listen to the stories of the PWs, but at some point when they're gone, these cells will be the last thing that still hold their memories. And so walking into the exhibit, it's more than just the mu museum with a plaque and information. You can feel at a resonant level the emotions, the experience, and the memories of the men are still embedded in that concrete. There's just, there, you can't describe it. You have to go see it. Yeah, I agree with Heather. My connection with that generation is at the start of my 30-year-plus Air Force career. My first pilot wings came from Larry Chesley, who was a POW for seven years. I never really understood the significance of that until later in my career when I met a lot of other POWs. So my hat's off to Rob's team because... Not only do they have the actual artifact there, as Heather's described, and the memories of those POWs are soaked into that concrete and brick, and it's such an interesting setup in that you sit there as if you're in the next cell. The wall is partially dismantled of its bricks and concrete or, or plaster, and you look into this cell from the perspective of those POWs, but also you can just move to the outside and see where their captors were circulating around and actually locking them into the shackles and that sort of thing. I was in there a long time just reflecting on my respect for this generation from Vietnam. They went through such sacrifice for our freedom. And once again, my hat's off to Rob's team for having made it as impactful as it is. I totally agree with Stutz. It was one thing to go through survival school and learn the techniques and, and learn about that, much of which, as Gene said, is different today because we learned from their experiences and first-class training, but to actually be there is something entirely different. And it goes back to what Gene said regarding where you learn to resist. And it comes down to values that, that being an American, no matter what side of the political party you're on, no matter where you stand today and all of the divisiveness, being an American is something special and what our nation stands for is something special. And that was what kept the light on for these men. Yeah, and we are lucky in our circles of being aviators and having learned these lessons academically just from the circles that we were in. But to find the strength and motivation from these others, I think that's the ultimate thing that they can give to us as Americans are their lessons learned from being in captivity. But Rob, I want to ask you this because obviously you've put a lot of thought and effort into this, but being there, you put together this event, and as I understand, you had eight POWs there with you. Can you share some of the experience for those of us that weren't fortunate enough to be there that day? We were fortunate enough to have 16 POWs that came to the uh, oh, unveiling, wow. okay. um, and they shared their stories, and it was just such an amazing opportunity to hear what got them through it. That is, I think, something that a lot of people can relate to. We've all had bad days and they found ways to get through it. And Gene touched on that earlier. It's that story of survival. You cannot teach that. He was going back to the fabric of his being, talking about what it was like as a young man growing up and his coaches and his love for America and all these things that brought them through it. But it was really one another. And that was very evident when you hear their stories. Even if they weren't in the same cell, they were using those tap codes to tap to one another messages. And every time one of them went off 
for what they called a quiz, which was torture. They came back, they would tap to them, GBU, God bless you. They were always there for one another to pull one another up when they had their worst days. And humor was also very clearly a big part of this, big part of their survival. So Slick, first of all, I have to say, the dedication of duty of the Vietnam Airmen is incredible. These guys experienced what today's generation of pilots, even though we spent 20 years in Iraq and Afghanistan, have never experienced. They're every day going downtown, they're getting shot at, there's AAA, all sorts of flak, surface to air missiles, and not everybody's coming home. But they get up the very next morning and go and do it again. And what you heard from Gene is I just, that's the reason why we serve. My dad was a Vietnam airman, and that's why I chose to serve. And I'm convinced that today's airmen would do the same thing. We haven't sent them up for success. We don't have a pilot force that is built for that high-end war. And by that, we don't have the numbers of pilots or aircraft to be attrition tolerant. That would demand not only that we actually have high volumes of aircraft, so the capacity that we need, but that we also have a larger pilot production pipeline. In the 1990s, when we cut the Air Force in half, we also closed down a boatload of pilot training bases. And that is actually why we have a pilot training crisis today in peacetime. We're already over 1,500 pilots short, and nobody is shooting us down. So you've got AETC doing heroic efforts trying to compress the pipeline, but there's only so much that you can do and still have a quality product at the end. We just don't have the ability to produce pilots and then experience and absorb them so that they become useful, smart combat rounds at the rate that we need to. If you think about it, this is also why all the fourth generation aircraft are single seats, because every time we lost a Phantom, we lost two aviators. And we can't afford to do that in the next war. So when we took our foot off the gas when it came to the pilot training enterprise, it wasn't just pilot production. We've got to rethink about how we're doing pilot training today for those experienced pilots. We need to dial up the threat simulations. I know that we're doing simulation, but we need to marry both a live fly and virtual, like that live virtual constructive. We need to get to that. We need to rebuild the hours that folks are getting. And we have to do that so that we can retain our experienced operators. Airmen come to the Air Force because they want to do their jobs. We've got to train them so that they're doing that so they can be credible when we go to combat. Unmanned aircraft or collaborative combat aircraft might help augment what we need to do, but we are going to need human pilots in the battle space for quite some time given the skill sets we need. Boy, you say it so well, Heather. Let me just say something about the aircraft. This is very important when we talk about our airmen having the ability to fly and fight. When Gene was flying, fighter planes averaged single-digit years on average in terms of their age. And now the fighter force is probably on the average around 30 years old. And then our bombers are even older. Second, we have way too few fifth-generation aircraft and far too many types that were built for the Cold War, not for today's threats. They're just not viable against a high-end adversary. The third point on aircraft is the combat aircraft inventory. The Air Force is both geriatric and it's too small. So in the high-end fight, we have to think in terms of what aircraft we're going to see lost, and there's nothing to backfill those losses. And I'll say a fourth part of this is the state of the inventory really compounds the fighter pilot problem that you were talking about, Heather. We'll just lose too many pilots, too many crews, and we'll struggle to replace them because they can't be replaced overnight. If you recall, Heather, back in Gene's time, there were just ample numbers of pilots and backseaters who were in staff positions and other assignments that could come out of those positions to backfill the human loss in Vietnam. So given what air power means to the joint force, this is really an existential factor in the future victory against a high-end adversary. Now, we, we honor the dedication to duty and the bravery of airmen like Gene, and we should make good on that honoring of his generation by doing everything in our power to ensure that future airmen never have to go through what he endured. A small old combat Air Force fleet is not going to deliver. No, you're absolutely right. You know, Stutz, I, I, I think it's a moral obligation. 
It is yes. a moral yes. obligation of our nation to make sure that our airmen have not only the equipment, but the experience and the training that they need to be able to do what we ask them to do, to go into bad guy land, do their mission successfully, and come home safely. And what you talked about, like, we don't have the inventories, we don't have the time. This really kind of gets at what I talk about often is the strategic surprise time horizon. So you guys have heard me say this a bunch. Oh, it yes. takes five years to build a combat aircraft. Right. It takes five years to build a combat pilot, which means if we know that we're going to war in less than five years, we're already too late. And so it comes back to that Rumsfeld quote, you go to war with the force that you have. I'm going to take a moment here and just geek out a little bit. You guys also know I love the thud. Yep. I love the thud. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and so the other piece about the small fleet is really important because that was that was a problem of the aircraft that Gene was flying, the F-105. The production line for the thud had closed by the time Gene was shot down. And people love to say half of F the F-105s built were shot down over Vietnam. And that's true because they stopped building them. If you look at the numbers, more phantoms were shot down in Vietnam than thuds. So that it really, it's, it's statistics. But the problem, the reason why they pulled the thud out, remember, they left some of them to be wild weasels. But they th withdrew the thud generally from combat because inventories were too small to sustain the combat operations. They couldn't maintain them, and they couldn't train for them stateside. So they couldn't train pilots in the thud. So all the stuff that, that is foundational to keeping an aircraft inventory viable for combat operations, it was no longer relevant for the thud because it was such a small force. Now think about this, 800 aircraft, 850 aircraft was a small force for the Vietnam era. But like you take a look at the F-22, 187 were built. That's a very small force. B-2, 20 were built, but we're even down numbers there. And the B-52, those lines are closed. So that's why we've got to think about boosting the size of our inventories now, because otherwise it's too late when the war starts, because you can't build these airplanes fast. Look at how we're already struggling with munitions for Ukraine, and planes are far more complex. Yeah, I think Gene's experience should really stand as a wake-up call. You and I, Heather, we know what needs to be done, and part of this podcast is explaining that to the public, explaining it to Congress. People need to understand that it's a wake-up call to harken back onto the experiences of Vietnam. Uh, we can't ask our servicemen and women to suffer for lack of solutions. We need to ramp up more modern aircraft to bring that fifth generation ratio way up as fast as we can. They need to have the quality training they deserved. We need to expand the capacity and so forth. I was trained by Gene's contemporaries. They came out of Vietnam, and my first assignment was in the Philippines. And the, these were airmen who had learned from the uh, victories and the tribulations of Vietnam, and they saw their friends get shot down. They were tough on my generation of new baby fighter pilots coming up. And there was a reason why they were so determined to not let many of the factors that occurred then happen again. And we re need to rekindle that spirit of the Vietnam generation. We need it today. Amen. Yeah, and that is that is the takeaway. They're such an inspiration. And Rob, thank you for what you've done there to bring this back, to tell this part of the American story that unfortunately could easily be forgotten in our modern world. So again, thanks for what you've done, and we are going to come visit you soon. My pleasure. We'll look forward to having you up here really soon. Rob, if I can, again, I want to thank you for the bottom of my heart what you and your dad uh, did for us. Well, Gene, it's our pleasure, and we're doing this to thank you and all the guys who served over there. We have such an utmost respect to everyone who served, and especially to you. And there's some guys that just were so special to us, Bud Day and Leo Thorsness and uh, Orson and, and those guys that have done so much for all of us. And this is just a tiny little way for us to thank you for all that you've done for our country. We really appreciate it, Rob. I appreciate it. Can't wait to have you up here, sir. Yes, sir. Gene, I, I just can't say thank you enough for you sharing this story and, of course, the emotions that I go through as a person who's never even been close to your shoes, but just your words and inspiration of what you did endure as an American airman really means a lot to us. So thanks so much for being here today. All righty, guys. See you, Gene. Luck. Thanks, Gene. Done. Thank you, sir. Okay. See you guys again.
With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas you think we should explore further. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and check six.